Hello, folks. Thanks for coming to Know Your Enemy update on spotted wing Drosophila ecology. This talk was developed uh, by myself, Matthew Grishop, Dr. Joanne Wong, and Ariana Hernandez. We all are with Michigan State University Department of Entomology. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to review a little bit of basic spotted wing Drosophila biology. I'm going to provide some updates on what we know about this insect's host range or reproductive range. We're going to talk a little bit about some recent monitoring research uh, focusing on the winter morph of this insect, and then I'm going to review some things we know about cultural control. Spotted wing Drosophila, or Drosophila suzukii, is a vinegar fly native to Asia. Since 2008, it spread throughout the fruit-producing regions of the world, with the notable exceptions of Australia and New Zealand. The as one of the big aspects of spotted wing Drosophila that makes it such a problem is the presence of this uh, specialized ovipositor. This bladed ovipositor allows it to lay eggs in ripening fruit, whereas most vinegar flies only take advantage of compromised fruit. The other major factor that makes spotted wing Drosophila such a horrible pest is it has a very short life cycle. Um, it only takes it about 8 to 16 days to go through an entire generation. So this means that there are many potential generations per year, and these generations become overlapping very quickly, making IPM complicated. Another aspect of this insect's life cycle is that there are two distinct morphs of the fly. The summer morph of the fly, which is light in color, and the winter morph of fly, which is dark in color. Recent evidence suggests that the winter morph is the overwintering stage of this fly, and probably um, this is helped by the fact that winter morph are more resistant to desiccation and low humidities and have a lower critical freeze point. So now let's talk about the reproductive host range of spotted wing Drosophila. Beginning in 2008, we really focused on fruit developing in the field. And what we found was that small fruits like blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, and then uh, tart and sweet cherries are all excellent hosts of this insect. In addition, a stone fruit with thin skins can also be an infield host for this, and grapes with thin skins or grapes that have split are a good host for this. Something we didn't think about initially was whether or not fruit wastes. So rotting fruit, including things like apples and maybe things like fruit pomace or leftover pressings or coals. We asked this question in my laboratory, and this is some data um, collected and published by Harit Ball in 2017. And the way we did this is we went out to 15 farms in lower Michigan, collected fruit wastes of all kinds, and this figure provides a pretty good overview of what we found. Basically, everywhere we collected fruit waste, we found spotted wind drosophila in that fruit waste. Um, two things that we thought might be linked to the prevalence of spotted wing Drosophila. It seemed like where we had multiple fruit crops side by side, we found more in wastes, across wastes, and then um, areas that had attached cider mills or processing facilities. So places where you end up with a lot of fruit waste seem to produce more spotted wing Drosophila. Since 2018, other folks have been asking similar questions about reproductive range of spotted wing Drosophila. This is a really interesting paper published by Dara Stockton in late 2019. And what she did in this paper was she compared the productivity of spotted wing Drosophila provisioned with the artificial diet that we rear them on in the lab, and then diets constructed from either apple, mushroom, bird manure, or combinations of those three feedstocks. Dr. Stockton collected a lot of really interesting physiological data. I'm just going to focus on the relative productivity of the diets that she tested. So to do this, what I've done is calculated the ratio of production for individual diets versus the cornmeal control. So the way you can interpret this graph is that a score of one is the eggs, pupae, and adults that would be produced on cornmeal. So any of these diets to get close to this line are probably viable um, diets for spotted wing Drosophila reproduction. And the big thing that pops out of this figure is that it is only diets that contained a large quantity of bird manure that were not comparable to the cornmeal. So the take home from this is that spotted wing Drosophila has a much wider reproductive range than we previously thought. And from a management perspective, this means that we need to be thinking about fruit wastes fungi and other decaying matter, as well as developing fruit when we're thinking about managing this insect. 
So I'd like to switch gears now and talk about monitoring and some interesting ecology we think we're learning from recent studies. So the standard trap for spotted wing Drosophila are these cup traps that contain either a commercial lure or a yeast sugar bait blend. The way these work is that you've got a clear trap with little holes and the flies fly in and drown in the solution. Ariana Hernandez, a master's student working in my lab, has been doing some interesting work with this in relation to the summer and winter morphs of spotted wing Drosophila. Here's the summer morph. Here's the winter morph. These are darker, more resistant to low humidity and low temperatures compared to the summer morph. Ariana noticed that she wasn't seeing a lot of flight when she was doing behavioral work with these insects. So she conducted an interesting experiment. She put a cup trap high in a cage and on the floor of a cage, and then released 120 summer morph and uh, winter morphs into that cage, and then just looked at what she recaptured over a 24 hour period. And here's a very simple rundown of what she found. So this figure shows the proportion recapture over the total flies that were released. And then summer morph recapture and winter morph recapture are presented in summer and winter respectively. This is the cup on the floor. This is the cup hanging. The big take home from this is that winter morph were very rarely caught in the hanging trap, much more frequently caught in, on, in the floor trap whereas summer morph were caught in both traps. So does this suggest that if you're going to trap winter morph spotted wing drosophila, you wanna put your traps low to the ground? Well, lab data is great, but you gotta do things in the field to confirm what you see in the lab. So what Ariana did was set up a four treatment experiment in woodlots in, at Michigan State University. We use woodlots because we find a lot of spotted wing drosophila in the off season in woodlots. So she used a hanging cup, a cup on the ground. Uh, this is protection from raccoons and rodents. And then she also evaluated some specialized traps which are used for catching stored product insects on the floors of stores. Um, and she put one of these on the top of the leaf litter and one underneath the leaf litter. So a little detail on this trap. It's a very simple trap. It's a modified pitfall trap. You've got this sort of volcano pitfall and then a cover. The target insect climbs up on the volcano and falls into a drowning solution, which is protected by the cover. So this is what allows it to be put under the leaf litter. So I'm going to show you this data in two chunks. I'm going to cover what we saw beginning in November through May 1st of this year. And then we're going to look at what we found from May 1st of 2020 to uh, late September. So these two figures show the same data. This shows it over time. This shows it aggregated over time. Um, in this figure, the cups uh, are presented with squares, uh, solid meaning hanging, um, clear meaning on the ground. And the domes are in circles with the dome on the ground solid and the dome under the leaf litter as a, an open circle. And really it's a pretty simple conclusion here. Um, we didn't catch a lot of spotted wing Drosophila except in this one area in late November and early December. And when we did catch them, a lot of them were caught in our cup on the ground. And this is reflected if you look at the totals. The other thing that's provided here in the totals are the non-target Drosophilids. And the big sort of take home on them is we didn't catch a lot of non-targets on the dome on the ground or our dome trap in the leaves, we caught quite a few in our cup traps. So while our, uh, the patterns look pretty clear, uh, we didn't catch a lot of spotted wing Drosophila, so we couldn't separate mean captures statistically. So we decided to look at this data a different way. We basically just asked the question in a given time period at a given set of traps, um, if we caught spotted wing Drosophila, which trap cost the mo caught the most? So what this figure shows you is the number of times out of 15 that a particular treatment caught the most flies. And what we find here is a very clear indication that the cup, cra cup trap on the ground performed best. So this data is a continuation from the previous slide showing um, trap captures collected from May 1st uh, through September 26, 2020. So the interesting things from this data are that suddenly in August, um, the dome traps both above and below the leaf litter became really good traps. We think what's going on here is that spotted wing Drosophila are moving into the leaf litter looking for overwintering locations, um, but we can't say that for sure yet. The other interesting thing from this data is that bycatch or the catch in red here is much lower on ground traps compared to cup hanging traps. So this means 
um, that a, if you're going to monitor spotted wing drosophila in the early or late season, you may want to have some ground traps. And an added benefit is that you might get less bycatch. A big hypothesis coming out of this is, is spotted wing drosophila actually using leaf litter to overwinter in? So now I'd like to talk about cultural control. The thing to realize about cultural control is that these are things we do in our farming operations to try to minimize the success of a pest. It will unlikely provide economic control in itself, but hopefully what it will do is make other pest management more successful. I'm gonna talk about sanitation, canopy management, and ground management. Since we know that spotted wing drosophila reproductive range includes uh, decaying fruit, it's very important to dispose of fruit properly. And ways that have been proposed to do this are freezing, bagging, burning or burying, composting with manure. Another recommendation that I think uh, should be made is sanitizing non-host fruit crops. So for instance, if you have apples nearby, don't allow uh, grounded apples or apple waste to sit around. They're being used by spotted wing drosophila. Bagging and solarization is one proven way to reduce spotted wing drosophila infestation of waste raspberries. Basically this work um, conducted by Heather Leach and some others um, showed that if you put waste fruit in a clear plastic bag and leave it in the sun for 32 hours, you can reduce uh, larval densities by 99%. Um, however, this practice may not be applicable to other cropping systems. Alternative options. Well, one thing that, that Nikki Rothwell of the Northwest Horticultural Center has looked at is the potential of crushing tart cherries to reduce uh, fruit waste utilization by spotted wing drosophila. So this is a, a picture of Nikki. She's in a golf cart and she's rolling over some tart cherries placed in the in sort of the wheel track of this golf cart. And this photo shows, you know, what happens after a little bit of time. Cherries you don't crush, you know, will hang out for a week or two. Cherries you do crush break down very rapidly. So let's look at some data and some more pictures of, of what Nikki accomplished here. So the pictures show um, fruit waste that has been crushed and what it looks like after nine days versus fruit waste that is uncrushed and what it looks like after nine days. What this figure uh, bar chart shows is um, the progression of spotted wing drosophila larvae collected out of crushed and uncrushed fruit over a nine day period. And the big take home here is pretty simple. Basically, if we crush fruit, we only get an appreciable number of spotted wing larvae out of this at day three, it drops to zero by about day nine. Whereas if we don't crush it, it really is only starting to peak at day nine. And I'd, I'd have you recall here, nine days is a pretty good estimate for one full generation of spotted wing drosophila um, during July and August. Burial is another way that we might reduce the reproductive potential of fruit waste for spotted wing drosophila. A graduate student that worked with me, Holly Hooper, did exactly this. And the first question she really wanted to answer was, how deep do we have to bury fruit wastes? So to do this, she conducted a semi-field experiment where she used small amounts or intermediate amounts of apple pomace infested with spotted wing drosophila and buried them at different depths. So this is the way this experiment worked. Infested fruit waste was put on the surface of an area or then buried at about five inches, um, 10 inches, uh, 15 inches, and about a foot and a half. Um, and this was replicated. Uh, soil was put at the appropriate depth. Cages were put over these soil columns so that uh, any emerging flies could be caught. And then uh, flies were caught on traps and vacuumed out of these cages and counted daily. And this is what Holly found. There's an exponential decrease in the emergence of adults from this fruit waste as you, as you go down in depth. And for us, it looked like at about um, 10 inches or 24 centimeters, we could pretty much eliminate spotted wing drosophila emergence from these fruit wastes. So this really suggests you wanna bury your fruit wastes about a foot. Another project that Holly completed while working with me was looking at how composting fruit wastes with poultry manure could be used to uh, dispose of fruit wastes. And so the basic concept here is that we know that fruit wastes of all kinds, if let to rot, will be drosophila 
sources. The question really was, if we incorporate the right compost feedstock, can we shut down spotted wing Drosophila reproduction? Preliminary research that at Holly did showed that poultry manure seemed to do this, but we wanted to validate it in the field. So this is what she did. A similar experiment where we had an intermediate volume of apple pomace um, that was pre-infested with spotted wing Drosophila uh, was put out in the field. And basically we ranged from 100% apple pomace 90%, so 10% by volume would be chicken manure, 75%, 25% chicken manure, 50%, 50% chicken manure, and just straight chicken manure. These mixes were put in um, little uh, watering stock tanks for, for livestock in the field. Uh, so, you know, we had about, uh, I want to say 20 gallons of material in each of these. A cage was put over the top. And she seeded them with spotted wing Drosophila, although we found that there was already spotted wing Drosophila in our pomace when we got it. Um, and then she trapped and removed spotted wing Drosophila on a daily basis uh, once they started emerging from, from these mixes. Here's what Holly found. Much like burial, if we increase the amount of chicken manure we put into our fruit waste, there's an exponential decline of spotted wing Drosophila reproductive output. At 10% by volume, we had almost entirely eliminated spotted wing Drosophila from our pomace. And at 25% or above, we reached a statistical zero. So what this means is that by incorporating even a relatively small volume of poultry manure, we can shut down spotted wing Drosophila reproduction. Solarization, crushing, and burial are other good options. The next set of questions that we'll be tackling on this is whether these tactics can be implemented at farm scale and whether when they are, they actually affect local populations of spotted wing Drosophila. Canopy management is another way to approach cultural control of spotted wing Drosophila. And the data that I'm gonna present was really collected and organized largely by Dahlia, um, Delilah Rendon of Oregon State University. The concept here is that if we prune heavier in raspberries, blueberries, and blackberries, um, we can increase airflow in our canopy, increase temperatures, and decrease relative humidity. The question is, is whether this will have an impact on spotted wing Drosophila populations. This was very complicated research, but the answer is sort of, it depends. Um, in general, what was found was that Dense canopies produced more spotted wing Drosophila than intermediate prune canopies and heavily pruned canopies. But again, it varied quite a bit from state to state and environmental condition to environmental condition. And this really comes down to what is the causal relationship between pruning and reducing spotted wing Drosophila? This is a hot off the presses review published by uh, Torsten Schoenberg. Um, he's at University of Maryland. And he did a meta-analysis looking at scads of pruning data and, sp and spotted wing Drosophila um, response to that. And this is kind of a complex figure, but it's kind of neat. What it basically shows is gray bars show weak relationships. If it's a positive number, it means there's a positive um, relationship. If it's a negative number, it's a negative relationship. And dark bars, these black bars, mean that there's actually a statistically significant relationship. And the big one from this figure to me is that what Torsten found in his meta-analysis was that um, canopy hours of under 70% relative humidity were significantly and pretty uh, monumentally associated with reductions in spotted wing Drosophila infestations of fruit. So what this means is that Heavy pruning can reduce spotted wing Drosophila, but this effect is probably dependent on shifts in relative humidity. And so really the fundamental question becomes, can you shift humidity enough? And I'm not convinced in Michigan we can do this because we tend to have very high uh, humidity during the growing season. Now that said, in a particularly dry year, you might see a benefit from this. And I suspect in climates um, like uh, the Western fruit producing regions, something like this might have a real impact on spotted wing Drosophila. But there's a lot of work to be done here yet. Delilah was also very involved in looking at floor canopy um, management and how that could affect spotted wing Drosophila. And basically, this came down to using different mulches under um, blueberry plants. And they looked at uh, different wood-based mulches, bare soil, as well as uh, synthetic mulches like this landscaping cloth. 
So uh, what was found here is that really the only mulch that had a, a negative impact on spotted wing drosophila appeared to be the synthetic weed mat. And what appears to be going on here is that there's this sort of interesting uh, phenomenon where when they compared this side by side, they found that spotted wing drosophila pupae put on top of weed mat or on top of the soil um, tended to die, um, but underneath the soil, they tended to survive. And um, there was even the, the mortality is really attributable to probably reduced humidity and increased temperature in those zones. So we think what's going on with weed mat is that basically synthetic weed mats prevent spotted wing drosophila from burrowing into the soil where there's higher humidity environments, which promotes successful pupation. So plastic weed mats can interfere with spotted wing drosophila. And probably this impact is going to be higher in drier, less humid climates than in more humid climates. There are lots of resources for what we're learning about spotted wing drosophila. Um, some of these you can find through the IPM MSU website. There's also a great website called www.spottedwing.org that provides more national resources on spotted wing drosophila. Since I did present a lot of cited or citable research, I did want to provide the citations and uh, you'll, you can look these up on your own if you'd like. And of course, uh, the research I presented, some of this came from folks that I directly collaborate with, a lot of it didn't. And there's a really amazing team nationwide of entomologists and horticulturalists working on this. Um, we're being funded through a wide variety of sources here in Michigan. Uh, Project Green um, is very important as our commodity grants, um, but the USDA uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture and SARE programs have been funding a lot of spotted wing drosophila work again, and I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. And with that, I would gladly take your questions.